start the book of First Samuel. Uh, much of the writing here is attributed to Samuel, as well as actually the book of Ruth as well. Um, the similar kind of pattern to Moses uh, with the first five books and Joshua with the book titled after him. Um, you see in these first three chapters, we're introduced to Samuel himself, but specifically um, the forerunning of his mother, Hannah, uh, the priest Eli. And you see, the, again, the corruption that was in the time period with Eli's sons um, having all kind of stuff going on, um, even though they were serving as priests. And uh, Samuel is born into a situation where his mother's faith um, is the only reason he even exists. Um, God births him into the uh, priesthood, um, being brought up by Eli, and then actually speaking to God, uh, or Samuel speaking to God directly as a young child. Um, so many, many important passages. First Samuel chapter 4 involves Philistine victory and the Ark of the Covenant being stolen, Eli's sons being killed, and Eli passing away at the news. There was much death and turmoil in this chapter, but unfortunately, the Philistines showed greater reverence for God than the Israelites did during this time. Chapter 5, God makes a mockery of the god Dagon, and they continually, the Philistines, move this Ark of the Covenant from town to town, trying to avoid the plagues that follow. From there, you see the same issue of irreverence when it comes to the children of Israel. They return the Ark of the Covenant back to Israel, and many Israelites die because they look in the Ark. They don't regard God as holy. Um, from here, you see repentance. Chapter 7 issues some of uh, really the summary of Samuel's public ministry. But um, you see in chapter 8, uh, as Samuel has grown old, his sons have fallen down the same evil path of Eli's sons. And now, 1 Samuel 9 through 12, you have the culmination of Israel's first king. You meet Saul in chapter 9, as you see uh, he and Samuel come together through God um, sovereignly working behind the scenes. Samuel is able to set up a uh, meal with him and, and elders uh, within the religious system. And so Saul is privately anointed in chapter 9. Uh, there's a public confirmation of him being king in chapter 10. And chapter 11, you have the uh, battle that really cements um, this new authority, this new leadership. Um, Saul rises um, and the opportunity is there. And after the victory, they go back and, and re-proclaim the same confirmation of Saul being the new king. Samuel uh, speaks to all involved and challenges them to follow God uh, because that's the only way that they will. Samuel 13 and 14. It's possible that some of these events through these chapters are not chronological, but the important thing about God's Word, and especially what we see in passages like these chapters today, is that when details are blurry, or especially if you can't tell certain details through chronology or, or those kind of things, we always know that the inerrancy of God's words uh, maintain the meaning of what is needing to be portrayed. And we know from these chapters that a couple things are um, highlighted through Saul's battles with the Philistines. And this is culminated in these chapters, in these events. The pride of Saul, um, his separation from um, Samuel especially, and, and operating in the realm of kingship, um, as well as functioning with the priestly duties himself, um, taking that very literally. And then also you see the humiliation um, in the events here in these chapters that happens with regard to Jonathan. First Samuel 15, you have Saul disobeying God for what will be the final time as the official king of Israel. Um, the kingship would stay with him for a while, but God's hand would be removed after the 15th chapter. Um, he did not obey God's orders. Um, God said that he was grieved and, and wished he had never made Saul king and he would choose for himself a king. It's interesting if you go back and look at uh, chapter 9, verse 6, he was originally anointed, Saul was anointed a commander or prince over Israel. Uh, but now in chapter 16, a young boy, very opposite in many ways of King Saul, would be anointed. Um, this eventual King David in chapter 16 slays a giant named Goliath in which we all are very familiar with uh, the story. Um, pray that the reading of chapter 15 through 17 will bless y'all today uh, as we dig into the next part of the monarchy. First Samuel 18 through 20, Psalm 59 and Psalm 11. You have uh, many times where Saul comes at uh, David, sometimes in 
uh, straightforward manners, sometimes in subtle manners. And um, you see between these two psalms that the righteousness and the Lord's uh, faithfulness is juxtaposed to that of um, the injustice of, of the enemies of God, um, the wicked. And you see specifically uh, Michael, the uh, daughter of Saul, who actually saves uh, David's life in 1 Samuel 19, uh, the context of which uh, Psalm 59 is accounted for in. And you can almost see Saul's men um, as they're described in Dogs on the Hunt. Um, we do know that God was always with David through these times, as well as the faithful friendship he had with Jonathan, the son of Saul. 1 Samuel 21 through 24, a 20 year old David, now five years after his victory over Goliath, flees. Uh, first and stops with Ahimelech, the priest, and receives the sword that Goliath had used and uh, a blessing from Ahimelech. And later, this would cause many of the priests to be slaughtered um, by Saul and a certain Edomite named Doeg. And many of Saul's men uh, go against Saul in this moment. Um, but they would stick with Saul uh, in pursuing David. There's many times where um, they would almost catch David, but different uh, sovereign things would prevent that. Uh, the height of this, these chapters comes in chapter 24 when David has an opportunity to take Saul's life within a cave and yet refuses this opportunity, um, simply uh, makes a gesture showing that Saul, um, his life was truly in David's hands. Saul actually has a moment of sanity sanity um, and comes to his senses for a brief time saying that he knows that eventually David will be the king. He asked to make a covenant with David that when this happens that he would um, be kind to his members of his family. Um, and so the end of chapter 25 comes with some sense of solace, even though we know there's uh, more chapters ahead. Um, we see some redeeming qualities um, on the part of Saul. And a lot of that is due to the grace of God shown through David. Bless y'all. Samuel 25 through 27. Uh, you have uh, the context of David taking a, a few, couple wives. Um, we actually find out his wife, Michael, was given to um, another man by Saul since David's on the run. Um, but this context is chapter 25. And I'm actually going to link a sermon here. There's much detail that goes into Abigail and Nabal. Um, but Pastor uh, preached an awesome sermon on it uh, last year. So I hope that y'all enjoy that. Um, but again, for the second time in uh, just a few chapters, um, you have David sparing Saul's life uh, in chapter uh, 26. And then once again in 27, you see him return to the Philistine area. This time he doesn't have to plead insanity like he had before. Um, but they believe that he is fully on their side. Um, and yet he obviously he's not. 1 Samuel 28 through 31 shows the end of Saul, and yet there are many different nuances in these chapters to bring up. So you have Ziklag, which is definitely the climax of David's story prior to becoming king. And at the same time, the Witch of Endor, which is kind of um, the lowest point for S Saul. Um, you see him seek out uh, the very type of medium that he originally outlawed from Israel. And him asking her to conjure up Samuel to receive a message you can tell uh, is intervened with God himself. She is terrified when, when Samuel appears, um, begins to prophetically speak the message of uh, Saul's demise. We knew this was coming, and yet we see it um, at the close of these chapters. And in the meantime, David is on the battlefield um, with the Philistines, has to leave, finds out his family is taken, and yet, in a very, very pivotal moment in which David sends for Abiathar, uh, the only priest remaining after Saul slaughtered all the priests of Nob. Um, and the, he brings the ephod. He brings um, the ability to talk directly to God and get a specific answer. And when David asks God, shall I pursue? He says, yes, you shall pursue and you'll recover. And so all this happens simultaneously to the battle that's taking place with the Philistines and Saul. So sovereignly, David is spared from having to be a part of that battle, um, or David spared. Saul actually kills himself um, when he sees that the Philistines will have his life, remembering back to all that uh, Samson endured with the torture of, of the Philistines after his capture. And so 
this takes place at the same time David uh, is over retrieving all that was lost in Ziklag. And so this is the conclusion of First Samuel with these kind of things happening uh, all at the same time. There's so much action in the first four chapters of Second Samuel. I pray that y'all will read through these chapters and glean much from uh, the events. Keep an eye out for how uh, David goes through many situations that we would see as victorious or exciting, and yet he would grieve um, and show much honor. Um, certainly want to uphold uh, the law of Moses, God's law. He respects the throne, respects innocent life, certainly does not approve of revenge. Um, again, much detail here happening. Uh, it covers two years of time in between when Saul dies and then his son Ishbosheth, who who reigned for two years. Um, Second Samuel chapter five verses one through ten. You have David being coronated as the king of Israel. Um, there in Hebron, he reigns for seven years, and then you have a, the rest of the forty year reign in Jerusalem and the capture of the city. Um, happens here in these verses. You also have the same account in chapter 11 of First Chronicles, and yet there's much more detail given about the mighty men of David and how they would slay people that would um, follow David. The interesting thing is you get differing perspectives, and yet nothing contradicts. You have, again, the fact the Philistines would not follow, even though there was an overwhelming support of David. We're taking 2 Samuel, starting in verse 11 of chapter 5, uh, chapter 6, as well as 1 Chronicles 13, 14, 15, and 16. Uh, in these chapters, you see a lot of detail uh, revolving around the Ark of the Covenant, um, David bringing it uh, to Jerusalem for the first time. You see the incident uh, where Uzzah uh, touches it is struck down by the Lord. Um, obviously, the holiness of God is still maintained even uh, from all this time since the writing of Leviticus. Um, you have an uh, interesting kind of psalm that is only uh, written in the 16th chapter of the Chronicles, uh, and you have much detail that is only given in certain portions of these texts, although many of the events overlap. pray that the reading of God's Word will bless you and that you would honor his holiness and worship him in spirit and truth. Two parallel chapters today between 2 Samuel chapter 7 and 1 Chronicles chapter 17. You see David uh, express the desire to build a house for the Lord to Nathan the prophet. And Nathan initially agrees, but then the Lord tells him that this is not um, God's will, which Nathan would then uh, relay to David. And David's response is probably the biggest takeaway from this. He responds in humility, um, certainly honors the Lord, um, even though his desires are, are not um, fulfilled. In this response from God, though, you see the Davidic covenant um, really first come into picture, and much of this has kind of dual fulfillment between Solomon um, specifically and other kings that will come, and then certainly eventually uh, Christ himself um, is the one that sits on the throne of David. So very important um, material in this, these chapters here, um, but again, some brief content overall in the grand scope. Bless you. Chapter 8 and First Chronicles chapter 18, you have uh, parallel accounts of conquests and uh, mighty exploits of David, um, different areas he conquered. Uh, the one distinction between these two is you find out in the Chronicles account that Abishai was uh, credited to one of the final um, things listed. And specifically as well, both accounts also mention that David's sons are advisors and helps in these battles. And in Second Samuel chapter 9, uh, a wonderful account uh, that's just specifically mentioned here, um, the name of Phibosheth. Uh, this is the last remaining uh, relative that's alive from Saul and of course Jonathan. This is Jonathan's son. A cripple in both legs, so he's he's unable to fight, but yet he's he's still alive at this point. David restores him, returns all the land, and says, "You will always eat." Happy Mother's Day, everyone! Today we have Second Samuel, chapter ten, and First Chronicles, chapter nineteen, as well as Psalm twenty. Uh, these two historical book chapters are a parallel, um, really covering the exact same account 
Uh, and then uh, Psalms 20 is a is a great read and has some special nuance for us. If you remember the Mephibosheth uh, cover in uh, the preceding chapter of 2 Samuel 9, this is really kind of a opposing um, happening. So you have that offering of grace that David bestowed upon Mephibosheth and that was received. Here you have another type example and that is not received. Um, it results in destruction and um, the Aramaeans and the uh, Ammonite many issues within within David. And interestingly enough, Psalm 20 verse 2 uh, uses the word help, which in the Hebrew shows up 19 times and first off refers to Eve, but it's mostly applied to God and always uh, referring to a source of strength. 2 Samuel chapter 11 and 12 and 1 Chronicles 20, you have David and Bathsheba, the uh, adulterous affair uh, that David commits. He has to cover up by murdering Uriah the Hittite, um, one of his beloved uh, commanders in the army. And obviously God knows about this, and uh, even though he's get, gotten away with it in the eyes of man, uh, Nathan exposes uh, the truth. And uh, the judgment is the loss of the child born because of this affair. Um, even though God would um, bless this union with Solomon uh, later on, you certainly see the beginning of the end when it comes to David's reign. Uh, in First Chronicles 20, it picks up the last six verses of these previous chapters, not talking about Bathsheba, but the conquest and victory over Rabbah. First Chronicles uniquely also talks about several Philistine giants falling. In 2 Samuel chapter 13, you see the struggle uh, that Nathan prophesied come to pass. Uh, it's been two years after uh, the birth of Solomon, and the oldest son of David, Amnon, rapes uh, Tamar, his sister. Uh, Absalom is the brother in between the two. Uh, very upset about this and more upset about the fact that David does nothing to the firstborn son. Uh, you have... Some time pass, and Absalom kills Amnon. In chapter 14, he flees, and when he returns, uh, there's a lot of deceit involved. Absalom uh, not only deceives uh, those closest to him, but winds up uh, deceiving the town, um, gaining influence, and eventually committing treason against his dad. Um, goes back to Hebron and tries to take the crown um, in the same way that uh David originally became king in Hebron. Psalms 3, 4, 12, 13, 28, and 55. I want to highlight a few different things. Uh, we won't look specifically look at each one of these, but Psalm 3 actually occurs when David uh, flees into the wilderness um, from his son Absalom, who is taking the kingdom from him. And you see the struggle and the turmoil uh, leave uh, in the sense of it ends on a note of tension. In the Psalms, you always see the word selah, or meaning pause, or like in the Hebrew, musically, to lift up. Uh, and the silence often uh, begs for an answer. Um, sometimes it ends on a positive note, and you kind of rest in that. Sometimes you're seeking an answer um, in the sense of turmoil. You see uh, much of this throughout. Another interesting point is we don't know that Psalms 28 uh, deals with the Absalom specifically, but 28. In 2 Samuel 16 through 18, you get the rest of Absalom's story. Uh, one thing today I would like to highlight is a sermon actually that was preached last November uh, by Antoinette. So if you're on our website, you can search uh, there on, in the sermons uh, podcast area uh, for a sermon called Bitter or Better. And uh, it specifically talks about Ahithophel, which uh, David prayed that God would uh, confuse the council of and and how Ahithophel was bitter but i would say uh as you read the scripture uh today these chapters definitely indicate uh, the bitterness of absalom as well uh one interesting thing that it jumps out as we go forward through the rest of the story uh joab is the one that kills absalom and again the son of david uh david definitely wanted uh absalom's protection even though um, obviously the treason that he was committing against him. So bless y'all today and hope it's encouraging. Second Samuel chapter 19, 20, and 21, you have some of the fallout uh, that happens after Joab has killed Absalom, returns, 
and uh, sees the despair and mourning of David. Um, there's some question as to why Israel has not um, looked to David again as king. And you see some of the rift uh, that exists between tribes of uh, Benjamin and Judah, known as Judah, and then the other ten tribes being Israel. This would be what would cause eventually um, two kingdoms, uh, but you can see the, the tension here even way early on. Uh, there's a wise woman uh, that saves an entire city called Abel, uh, and then a final heroic act that David um, does for the descendants of Saul. Uh, a lot that goes on um, in between here in these chapters, but a great read, uh, covering a lot of ground uh, in David's life. Bless you Good morning, everyone. Today we have 2 Samuel 22, 23, and Psalm 57. In these chapters, you have the only spot in the books of Samuel where you have a psalm uh, written. This is a coming at the end of David's life, uh, the victorious um, praise to God, thanking him for all the victory over Saul and, of course, all the other enemies that he would face uh, while he was king of Israel. And chapter 23 is poetic as well, some of the last words of David. Um, and in the rest of the chapter, you see a lot of information that is uh, picked up and parallel to some of what's found in First Chronicles chapter 11. Um, Psalm 57 is uh, a little bit of a... As we conclude the books of Samuel today, uh, we have uh, 2 Samuel chapter 24, First Chronicles 21 and 22, and Psalms 30. Here, David commits his final recorded sin when he numbers the people of Israel. A lot is left unsaid in these chapters, but what is clear from the Chronicles material is that the events uh, that follow will help determine the site of the temple. Psalms 30 is written in dedication of this temple in Jerusalem, but Solomon would be the one to build the temple. Um, this is uh, partially because of um, all the blood that had been shed through the wars that David would fight, and uh, Chronicles uh, chapter. 21 and 22 specifically let us know that um, God is going to give Israel a time of rest during Solomon's reign. Um, and uh, again, much material in these chapters, uh, but it's a blessing to read and